check. So if you're already in the space that Stephen has invited us into, this subtle noticing. of the quality of knowing. And there's no need to disrupt that, but just allowing that very subtle invitation, aspiration. to allow mental states, mental qualities, to make themselves known. There might be a subtle wanting or looking for something. And then that's what's happening. So we can allow that to present itself to be known. Urge in the mind, gathering of forces. Or there might be a subtle leaning away, pushing away some aspect of experience. And that that too can be an object of joyous, precise, calm, even Awareness. Even the subtlest resistance in the mind. or all different sorts of tuning out. Perhaps spinning in a thought train, planning, remembering. With the texture of that making itself known in the body, mind, being. Or it might be calmer, dreamy, touching 
into present experience, but then drifting off. Pleasant, but not precise or energetic. So we can know these qualities of grasping, aversion, delusion in the mind, heart, being, as they arise and change, wash over us and fall away. even the quality of doubt and indecision. Well, maybe I should do it this way. Maybe this is what was meant. We can know that swirling, unsettled, energy and its texture. And a moment of mindful, clear awareness of the texture of that experience, feeling it pervade the mind and body wash over us and fall away. In feeling the possibility of clarity about the experience of doubt in the moment, it's unstable, undependable, impersonal nature. In that moment, just through the invitation to my of mind to mindfulness to show up and know faith. Confidence, clarity can be born. The brightness and energy filling the mind body. Trust in the power of this mindful awareness. to be born and grow. And this too is just another experience washing over us, falling away, presenting itself to be known, the quality of faith, clarity, energy. Trust, what is its texture?
in this way, whatever arises, grasping, aversion, delusion. Faith, energy, mindful presence, collected concentration. All of these can just present themselves to be known. their specific texture, taste, flavor. And as we know, the texture of collected unified mind or energy or faith or doubt, aversion, grasping. Just by connecting with them in this moment, they can't help but show us they're falling away. Undependable, impersonal nature. We invite in the qualities that know whatever experience is arising with precision and energy and joy, calm, collected, even showing up. And then experience itself does the rest. It shows us it's falling away, undependable, impersonal nature.
in the final portion of the sitting period. Just appreciating the opportunity to become familiar with the texture of the mind as it's lost and the texture as it's present. Because just by feeling on this visceral embodied experiential level, what it is to be disconnected from experience, lost in a train of thought or dreamy. Just by feeling that experience becoming familiar, we can know the whole trajectory of the path of coming into awareness. by knowing more fully from the inside what it's like to be lost. We gain a sense of what it would be to become more and more awake.
Thank you. Lovely to be quiet with you. So I think Stephen will say, offer some Dharma inspiration elucidation and then we'll take questions and answers together Stephen will offer some Dhamma through the fog of sloth and torpor <laughs> having been in one place for two years, I'd forgotten what traveling to Asia and especially back from Asia, what that experience was like. I think I mentioned a little bit last week. But M Michelle, though she's still in silence for another five days or a week, she sends me these little whisper texts saying, today is the seventh day of your jet lag and your limbs will probably feel like they're a hundred pounds each. And trying to get to kitchen to get to your breakfast was probably feels like you're walking through molasses and mud and you may just roll over and fall back to sleep for four hours. And then like that throughout the day, little whisper texts and each day, now you will be feeling, you know, a, a little energy in the morning, but around noon, you'll just, you'll drop off and barely make it to have a, a bite, a snack, a midday snack and so forth. <laughs> and that's how I know that I'm not terribly ill or crazy, and then listening to, to Jake's very clear guidance, uh, I kept hearing him say words like calm, clarity, confidence, energy, mindfulness, focused, awareness, insight into the impersonality and ephemeral nature and selflessness, and I'm thinking, what is where is that? <laughs> Where am I noticing that? All I, all I feel is the lack of calm and, and incredibly tired mind and heavy body and confidence is wavering <laughs> often. And, and, and clar what's clarity now? What am I clear about? I think he said, when we're clear and touch upon uh, mind states like sloth and torpor, then the mind wakes up. And I repeated that to myself. The mind wakes up, sloth and torpor. My mind's waking up. My mind's waking up. My mind's waking up. What, what, what mind? <laughs> sloth and torpor. Okay, I feel it. I'm feeling it. That's all I'm feeling. <laughs> Where's the clarity? Where's the calm? Where's their fallibility and their falling away and their, their selflessness nature? <laughs> so, nothing better to do than talk about it a bit, these, this, these hindrances that we experience. Um, and through experiencing them and learning how to bring mindfulness to them, the five traditional hindrances that Jake touched upon in his instruction, I think, are um, sense desire followed by aversion or ill will, anger, followed by um, my current state, sloth and torpor, two different mind states with a common connection and then 
anxiety, restlessness, kind of the opposite of sloth and torpor, and often follow, alternate periods of sloth and torpor in our practice, daily practice, retreat practice, um, just living our life practice, followed by anxiety and, and restlessness. And then the, the arguably the strongest and most prominent of the five hindrances is doubt. In those moments, like I had when I was listening to Jake's instruction um, and hearing the terms of confidence and clarity, uh, connecting, uh, and energetic mindfulness and focus and so forth, um, I, I kept seeing if that was happening, if I was, that was my experience, and I really didn't know. And this is not uncommon when we practice. We, we're not quite sure, is it this or is it that? And we mentioned subtle experience, subtle phenomena, subtle mind states, and so forth. So too, the, the hindrances can be quite subtle, it can be very subtle craving, even in the higher reaches of insight practice, uh, when we have gone through initial stages of sloth and torpor, anxiety, restlessness. Uh, and so I was looking to see, but I would I get stuck on, you know, subtle, I would notice subtle, and then I just feel this I just, just backwash of sloth, subtle sloth, sloth, torpor, sloth, torpor, subtle. And then every once in a while I take a breath and know that I didn't know what was happening. I wasn't clear at all. And when our experience isn't clear, it's, there's almost certainly doubt there. In fact, doubt has to be there to some degree. Doubt is rooted in, in the unhealthy psychological state of delusion. Jake mentioned greed, hatred, delusion. Sense desire is clearly rooted in attachment, the wanting mind, and uh, aversion or ill will, anger, clearly rooted in the unhealthy psychological state of, of ill will, aversion. And the remaining three, sloth, torpor, anxiety, restlessness, and along with doubt, are all rooted in delusion. And in fact, at times delusion covers all the mental states of hindrances, the grasping, the pushing away, uh, the drifting, dreamy of sloth and torpor, the, the annoying physical, mental uh, anxiousness and restlessness that may be occurring and, and doubt itself. Because it's the nature of delusion through the doubting mind, the doubting heart, to hide these hindrances, to, to trick the awareness into not connecting, not having that sort of infusion of intentional, energetic, mindful awareness that can penetrate grasping, aversion, sloth or torpor, anxiety, restlessness or doubt. It's the job of doubt to cover, to confuse, to bewilder. So we, we want to know that because then we get a little handle of it. Upandita once taught uh, a strategy because he saw that I, my mind had been caught in doubt for quite some time. Uh, and so rather than trying to find that very ephemeral, hazy, uh, doubt, 
quality, which she later said is very hard to identify mindfully when it's up and strong, to, to like a, a skein of yarn, to find a string of something else, a string of aversion, disappointment, shame, judgment, uh, anger, uh, ill will, uh, wanting, you know, wanting the practice to be different, wanting the doubt to go away, or any kind of grasping, craving for something. To identify these little strings, little bits at a time, because th then there can be th those moments of clarity, as Jake implied, where we just, a, a nano moment of investigation, and we feel the actual physical sensation of grasping, clinging, uh, pushing away, ill will, judgment, self-hatred. Uh, we start to feel the drift and dream uh, and, and the difference between sloth and torpor, for example. Sloth is more when the, the mind is just weighty with no energy, no ability to connect, to feel sensation. It takes a lot to feel of the physical correlation to sloth because the, the mind wants to just uh, coast from one vagueness to the next vagueness. It is indeed drifty, dreamy, sluggish, slow, and sometimes these the images appear that allure us in, and, and sometimes there's enough energy to think, oh, this is the piece of meditation. I think this is perfect. I don't think Stephen or Jake know how great my meditation is at the moment. And then there's all these images that might come up and, and seem real, uh, but they're more phantasmagoric. If we really had a moment of focusing the, the imagery, which suggests fogginess and, and a kind of relaxation, but is, is drifty and dreamy, suddenly becomes apparent as a phantom. And these phantoms are what sloth stirs up in the heart, in the heart-mind. So the difference between sloth and torpor, torpor is when we actually um, start, start to nod out the image from the text. Is if, if you can imagine what it might feel like uh, to smother flame with ash that so the fire has no oxygen. So the heart mind feels claustrophobic, unable to breathe, unable to get air. And so there's no space. Sloth and torpor work like that. Intense jet lag is a couple of weeks like that. So Michelle texts me, you have five days left. <laughs> Expect five more days of, of, of feeling helpless and unable to take care of yourself. Crawl if you have to, you know, but try and get to the kitchen and have some granola or a granola bar at least, or some nuts and orange juice. You can do it one crawl at a time. And so it's useful to get that message. It's like a, a Dhamma infusion or transmission. And I say, okay, it's all right. Yeah, I've forgotten what it felt like. Uh, not doing this for, for years, a number of years. So like Jake instruction, we're, we're, we're trying to ident identify and find ways to connect mindfully, which in large part, we find success if we can embody the awareness in our senses in the body. So if you can't feel it as a physical correlate sensations in the body at first, like open the eyes and see, try and recognize what lens are we looking at? Are we looking through the lens of sloth and torpor? Are we looking through the lens of grasping, wanting something to happen or not happen, aversion to the experience, 
we use the other senses of seeing and hearing uh, and the other kind of sensing of our of our five senses the mental response reaction other judging states um, you know what is where is that pure kind of force field of non-judging non-doing awareness and, and just asking that question sometimes we'll get a, a moment of it a nano moment of that and then maybe we start to connect with the body where we feel the grasping mind as a clinching somewhere in the neck upper chest belly um, and aversion as a tension tightness burning and sloth and torpor yeah, a vagueness, hard to kind of precisely identify the sensation, but maybe we feel the droopy eyelids, heaviness around the eyes, and, and teariness that comes from sleepiness, uh, and the pull forward of the head. That's a sure sign. Try not to let the head go down when we feel sloth or torpor, or to lean back when we feel sloth or torpor. Call up the energy. Uh, to make the, the, the spine straight from the base from, of the spine in the pelvis right up to the space between the top of the spine and the brainstem. Try and feel that alignment and take breaths that fill and fill out the ribs, upper chest, and, and then gently, quietly kind of bring in the awareness to to soften around those physical sensations and that way be able to identify as Jake was saying, oh, okay, this is sloth if it's drifty, dreamy. Just to discern the difference between drifty, dreamy and the kind the suffocation of nodding out, torpor, to recognize the difference between the two brings energy, brings clarity. And then we'll feel more prominent sensations. Right, this is sloth. I'm feeling it here in the lower face and neck and torpor that pull to, towards sleep and the pull of the body forward or back, anything but upright and straight to take in and, and pull in the oxygen that awakens the body. We find all these various places. Similarly with uh, anxiety and restlessness, the body tells us, you know, with moving from sloth and torpor to um, anxiety and restlessness, the body suddenly has this energy. It's not smooth, it's not clean, and certainly not calm at first, but we recognize through the body energy and, and its agitation, we recognize, oh, okay, there's anxiety, there's restlessness, and it feels like this, and it feels like this here in the chest or in the belly or in the head, wherever it is that we feel and connect the sensation with the mind state. And with doubt, as Upandita taught me, if it's a strong doubt, doubt can Doubt is the most paralyzing of all the hindrances of our practice. It can literally stop our practice. So try to see within the cover, within the fog of doubt, what, what are the strands? What other hindrances can we pick up? Do we see the agitation, the wanting it to be different, the aversion to what is, uh, the sloth, the, ang the anxiousness, and so forth. And then that circular journey through the different senses, but back to how I started off, open the eyes. And sometimes with eyes open, we recognize any of the hindrances more clearly, because instead of just seeing, it seems to be seen as colored by distraction or wanting this or not wanting that. So we, 
we see objects and then we turn the awareness inward to seeing what's actually happening. And there might be aversion, there might be clinging, there might be desire for things to be different than they are. Or we recognize sloth and torpor. Same with sound. We can take refuge in sound. We all use that at times as an anchor. And that can restore some balance, some energy, some capability, increase our capability to compassionately, mindfully kind of surround any or all of the hindrances with, with this knowing mind, with this ability to kind of take some of the air out of the hindrances and restore and, and put it into the awareness, restore the heart, restore the oxygen in the heart. So even though then it may not completely deflate and allow the hindrances to be, as Jake was saying, impersonal and impermanent and uh, essentially ineffective because they're um, unreliable, they're not things to hold on to, they're not things to pick up, then the mind just lets it be. And letting it be, then we still may, we may have a relationship with the hindrances or we may see them falling away as, as Jake, Jake instructed us. So with that, um, let's open it up to see how your experience is. Um, since last week, you may have noticed various conditions when you when you have done your practice whether it's a formal practice or just general awareness as you move about your day move about your space um, and the posture that you might be in where you notice certain things and how, how you're able to work with it how it can seem overwhelming or crushing at times and how at other times something picks up and you, you let go of any struggle, you let go of needing it to be any certain way. And then interest um, often pulls up in the energy needed to carry the awareness into our experience. So please, if you have anything to add to that or to share about your experience or questions about it or about Jake's instruction or what I've said so far about kind of working with the hindrances, both as in the practice paradigm, but also we face the hindrances, all of us, in one way or another every day, just going about what we're doing. And we're trying to be more mindful no matter what we do. But we're pulled into objects with desire. We're repelled by objects that we don't like and that slothful or torporous mind. It will visit. It will visit you even if you haven't slogged halfway across the planet. Uh, and. Uh, are in this jar of molasses like I am. <laughs> so anyone, anyone, any, anything to say, anything to ask, please. Amy. Oh, I have to ask it on mute. I think that's what has to, oh no, you did it, great, okay. Oh, I did, yeah, I found the microphone. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to see everyone here again tonight. I haven't flipped through the next page, but I just want to thank everybody for being there for all these weeks. And Stephen, oh, I love you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, and um, I want to say that I've been using that, uh, the, the six R's or whatever, uh, when I have been so sleepy these last few weeks. And, um, you know, the first is to, recognize 
and then release the story, you know, and then, and then it's the relax and then the, like the re-smile, like re, um, adjusting to the joy of, of even just waking up for that moment. And then often the last two hours, I'm like back to the story. I start over again, recognize, release, <laughs> you know, and then uh, relax and then re-smile and then reset, you know, resetting to whatever the anchor is and then just restart. And that's been helping me um, a little bit, but I see I keep going, I keep finding myself on the R's and then I, it's, uh, and um, yeah, thank you for talking about the spine sitting up all the way, um, head, neck and shoulder, you know, aligned and in front of the pillow and, it's so sweet to see you again. Thanks for making the effort in your molasses jar, from your molasses jar. We love molasses. And, and then again, um, so, so sweet. Thank you for, uh, for all this time and for all the, all the whole Sangha. Really appreciate it. Much love. Thank you, Amy. It's the first time I ever heard of the six R's. <laughs> <laughs> It's easier for me to remember Michelle's rain. Recognition, acceptance, investigate, and um, non-attachment. I won't remember the six R's. Tell me when I come out of the molasses jar. <laughs> Are you raising a hand? Quinn? Yes, so good to see you again, Steve. Thanks, Quinn. Good to see and you. And Jake. Um, all the years that I, when I went to retreat, one of the, the worst, the most feared hindrance for me is sloth and torpor. Right. Some, somehow I found it's very painful. Hmm. And it's even more painful because I resist against it. And, but lately I decided, okay, if I'm sleepy, I'm just gonna nod off and sleep. And just took me a few minutes and then I come out really refreshed. Hmm. So at least um, I don't fear it as much. <laughs> I, I have that it's, skill sometimes. I don't know. It's have still it. there. It's still I don't there, have it but this week. <laughs> I don't feel it. It's a good one. It is. It's just, it helps you, helps us to let go. You know, it's a graceful surrender, Rupandita would yes. say. What, because, um, you know, he taught about working many ways to work with sloth and torpor, all the ways I mentioned. And then he said, you know, at certain times, you, you, you feel like you just, break out of a wet paper bag and feel victorious and feel this rush of energy. Yeah. Right. Having, yes. Yeah. But sometimes the way to that is to cons completely surrender being in the wet paper bag. Right. Yeah. Thank you. My experience is that uh there can be the kind of general resistance of, I don't want this to be happening. Uh, and then there can be sometimes the very specific re resistance, um, like for instance, with sloth and torpor on retreat, where maybe a flavor of shame in there or even just disappointment, but like I'm supposed to be meditating as a specific flavor of I don't want this to be happening. <laughs> so I was thinking of that when you were describing how painful it is and the resistance. And for me, you know, noticing how sometimes part of that, the specific flavor of that resistance is I'm supposed to be meditating and that's not what's happening instead I'm sleeping. It's the supposed to be that hurts. Right. And then 
I just really love this reflection that we're always cultivating something. The question is whether we're cultivating what we want to be. We're always cultivating something. So there is the aspect of like, okay, in that moment, to some degree, we're cultivating sloth and torpor, but then on top of it, I mean, I'm cultivating shame or whatever about the idea of meditation. So that's not, that's not what I want to be cultivating. Um, and I was also thinking, you know, that in English, we translate these as hindrances. The Pali term is nivarna, which means to kind of turn away. It turns us away from it could be any kind of skillful cultivation, you know, cultivating generosity or cultivating um, beautiful actions, cultivating the mind heart. <clears throat> so these qualities of grasping or aversion or restlessness and wor uh, uh, worry, sloth and torpor, doubt, not necessarily in that order, um, but the, they just turn us away from cultivating what we want to be cultivating in with body, speech, and mind. That, that's all. And, uh, but that I doubt one for me is just so underlying there. And I hear that too. It, for me, anyway, I feel it in my own experience of sloth and torpor on retreat, just like the, the not confidence the sh <laughs> in my practice in that moment. Sorry, Steve, go ahead. That's helpful. It, 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 uh, it stirred up the, the awareness that we all turn to the hindrances at times as a protection, as a defense. You know, we, do to, we, we, we want to turn away because something might be really uh, overwhelming, troublesome, difficult, painful. And we're not able to, to take it all in. This happened a long, long time ago when we were very young and, and didn't even have any tools at all to deal with stuff. So um, we learned to go there so long ago. It's actually a kind of refuge if we recognize it, that at times something is so incredibly difficult that I do want to be absorbed in something else you know, and are aversive to say, no, that's, I don't want that. You know, we can do that sometimes mindfully with compassionate, fierce compassion. No, that's not okay. Or sometimes, you know, when we don't have that ability, it's just aversion and ill will. And we use that as a protection. And same with sloth and torpor, we just turn it off. And we get agitated you know, about things. No wonder. There's so many things to feel agitated about. And we just go and just be agitated for a while, you know, in the same way Quinn was talking about surrendering the sloth and torpor, or, you know, and just t totally surrendering to it and then coming out feeling awake. Same thing can happen if we surrender to, to agitation and worry. We can suddenly feel calm from letting ourselves be protected for a while in that agitation, being in that state. And likewise with doubt, being bewildered, being confused, and, and not struggling to understand when we just can't. And so when we realize that, and we realize that they are for us sometimes a protection we come to understand them in that way uh, and we gain some awareness, we gain some oxygen while the doubt is happening because it's the hardest of all of them to identify, you know, in the end of all the strings on the skein of yarn, we, we pull away the disappointment and the shame and the ill will and the desire and so forth. And, and then for a moment there, doubt might be hanging in that in our in that palm of awareness for a moment and we see it as it really is oh yeah 
that's doubt and it disappears as it's all as they're all doing all the time anyway but the insight is as if we can attune to the speed of which that is happening and therefore see it see doubt as a doubt moment not as my doubt not i'm in doubt this doubt has a particular flavor it covers it bewilders it confuses it paralyzes but then it's gone You have a hand up, Richard. Looks like a okay. high five. Uh, you can hear me? We can hear you. Uh, uh, tonight, you know, to deal with uh, torpor, I, sloth and torpor, I just went back to basics and, and tried to count my in-breaths to 100. Hmm. And always starting over again when I got lost. Hmm. And I was only able, able to do it twice. Um, but That's, uh, great. That's great. <laughs> I couldn't do anything more subtle. If I was just, you know, trying to observe things, I would end up in a dreamy state again. <laughs> That's accomplishment. That's okay. That's progress. It's more than I could do. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. It's rare that that we can sustain that, that subtlety. You know, I mentioned another time, a previous sitting uh, about Upandita's um, term of early mindfulness. That's an illustration of subtle, subtle awareness of subtle states. It's, it's, just, it's, it's extremely rare, however, because our minds are, are, are thick. You know, they're not so subtle and they're not so relaxed. It takes a while. Just sitting together and having these discuss Dhamma discussions and it's a reassuring. It's reassuring to know that we all have these experiences. And then, you know, being able to count that way twice in a 40 minute sitting or so is, is a real accomplishment. You know, I'm, I'm not just say, saying that. You're dealing with sloth and torpor. And so you took up a, an exercise, a samadhi concentration practice. Uh, and, and that's, that's really good. So in those moments of counting, that's the practice of close to subtle and close to early mindfulness. We do our best with all the things that we learn. And we, we, we try to let go of any attempt toward perfection. Perfect imperfection is our goal. Imperfection is nature. Imperfection is another word for, for dukkha, for change. So every, every time we sit, every time we gather here on Sundays, we're practicing being perfectly imperfect with a big smile. <laughs> how was your subtle yeah very good Jake nice smile how, how was your subtle awareness when you're sitting Jake I, I had to get oh. some chai tea I thought you were asking Richard <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm asking you now. How is my you, subtle? Right. If you have anything to add to Richard's. Oh. Yeah. But also, yeah. What was your subtle meditation like? Or was it? I don't have anything to add. I think you covered it about the. Okay. Um, uh, times when 
maybe appropriate to bring in uh, <clears throat> a specific exercise. And yeah, it's probably more than I could do right now <laughs> too. <laughs> um, but it's always called, you know, it, with the aspiration for me anyway, of cultivating, if I'm doing Brahma Vihara practice, for instance, and cultivating a heart that's um, friendly or caring or gladdened or even, I'm doing it still with the aspiration of cultivating the qualities, inviting in the qualities so that this radical practice of mindfulness, of showing up for experience falling away, that that practice does itself, carries itself forward. And in the same way with the counting, you're calling in these qualities of concentration and energy. For me, if I was doing that, I'm doing it with the aspiration that those qualities then come in and can carry the moment to moment mindfulness or cult building those, cultivating those qualities that can then later carry the moment to moment mindfulness of, of its own accord so that there's nothing more for me to do. The practice does itself. Um, are you all, are you describing your experience today? No, no, I was <laughs> I was I was saying the thing the things in response after having said I didn't have anything more to add than I was adding stuff <laughs> <laughs> to, to Richard. Um, uh, sometimes moments of the practice doing a little bit of itself, but mostly um, Some resting, I really appreciated how you invited us into the subtlety. So I just, I was appreciating and enjoying that and not wanting to shake people out into maybe go to your breath or go to the body. I was just trying to stay with the subtle qualities of a mental experience because you had invited us in there and I relish and enjoy that and was connecting with that. So then I was, um, uh, connecting and sometimes looking to notice, oh, is there subtle wanting? You know, even I'm wanting to serve, wanting to um, be clear, wanting to um, wanting to occupy this space in a helpful way. So just noticing those inclinations in the mind and then um, also sometimes, you know, considering and worrying, okay, get it right. Should I do something else? <laughs> so those kind of mental states. Um, yeah, the persisting thing was just a kind of uh, slight tension in there just um, of, wanting to make sure getting it right or navigating the instruction in a good way and enough speaking, not too much speaking. So I was noticing that kind of tension under underneath. Also some flavors, threads, themes of just appreciating being here and just the appreciation and rest in, in that. Great, a good description. It, it reminds me to remind all of us that we're always in touch with that subtle awareness. So, so even when we're slogging through craving, aversion, sloth, torpor, agitation, doubt, there, there's a level of, because of our training, because of our practice, because we all are doing this, if we just take a moment to, you know, say, well, wait a minute. And, and, and like, as Amy was pointing out, this can realign our system, you know, he head to toe, or especially, you know, the, the, the pelvic area, the rib area, the upper chest, the head area and kind of feel that all that realigning, that's, that is subtle awareness. That's, that's in that alignment, in the awareness of doing that alignment, we're doing the subtle awareness. And appreciating that it's kind of there, even when we're slogging through more uh, heavier, dense material, physically, emotionally. 
appreciate that. We miss it. We miss how often the mind's already connected to our experience. Just like we miss the joy that's there when pain disappears. That moment of relief is joy. And we often miss it because we're, we start looking for something else, like with a bit of a mind bend, a mind agenda. But if we just kind of keep noticing those the falling away, like Jake is talking about, the hindrance is falling away, there's a, there's a moment of gladness or joy there, profound contentment there. And it's the subtle awareness that can you know, just catch that in a pause moment and feel that pause, that joy, that relief. That's the subtle awareness again. Skillful means is, is using, our, using our language to point that out because the actual experience is too quick for conceptualization. The, the reality that we're discussing is wordless, but it's helpful to hear. It's helpful to hear how often incredibly present we are. That's the definition of patana, of satipatana, of mindfulness, is the presence of mind, the here and now presence of mind that feels, senses, and knows. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure this is. Hi, Harry. Hi. I, I think we got a we got a feedback because we got two computers here. <laughs> you roll a treat for. The other one just needs to put on silent. Doesn't need to leave. But... Yeah. Well, actually, Kathy. Kathy's on her way. Um, okay. <laughs> This is a, it's, it's like the voices of Mara or the temptations of Christ or what I, I and, and they mean less and less, but this is kind of a, a, a related to doubt. It is for years I've thought, you know, on and off and have been reinforced, you know, by lots of society and people around me that, you know, you're just wasting your time with this stuff. Why don't you go out and live? You know, this is a refuge for people who can't, can't make it outside in, in not not in a financial sense, but just in the way, you know, if you spend more time in the water, if you mountain bike more, if you, you know, use drug, whatever it is, that's where life is. And, and if you can't do that, then you do this. That contradicts, that's contradicted by my experience in the practice, which is rich and vibrant and the most alive that I feel in the, uh, so my experience contradicts those voices and I see them more and more as I get older for what they are. Uh, what am I saying? I, I guess I, I don't expect them ever to go away. Um, and I can note wanting to go away. I can notice monkey mind chatter when, when they come in. Um, they seem more and more foolish to me now. Um, I don't it's know. It's a great way to just—it's a great way that you're describing the hindrances. Yeah, that's exactly what you're doing. In your own experience, in your own way, in your own metaphors. That's that's good. That's profound. It, it's yeah. It and and there's subtler kinds of doubt when in deep practice, and but this just this is kind of everyday thing and it's it's less and less every day because I look around me at these there's a Jackson Brown song I look around at the friends I used to turn to I, I look in their eyes and I see they're running on empty um, it's like that these things 
are running on entry. They are unsatisfactory. They are, you know, part of the three characteristics. They, and, and, and I see that. Um, I don't know what I'm saying. I suppose at some level, I really want them to go away. I want those voices to go away. I want the whole world to affirm that Harry Palmer's path is the, <laughs> is the correct path. You were right all along, brother. You know, we're, we're, you know, I'm giving up everything. I'm coming over to Jesus with you or whatever it is, you know. And, 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 uh, and there is that, you, you can see a lot of that around, <laughs> you know, a lot of that tendency around in the culture. The people that want you to come along to Jesus or this and that or this political <laughs> party and everything. And it's all bullshit. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's a, I just felt like I wanted to say something, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it's a good description of wish fulfillment. Say more about that. Uh, well, like your ideal, you want someone to say, it's okay, Harry, you were right all along. You know, that could be joining with Christ, it could be Nibbana. But it, it's, you know, it, it is a kind of wish fulfillment. If we, if we understand it, then it's just the, like you described, just voices in, in your head and you don't believe them anymore. How's, the, you, how, how's it wish fulfillment? I'm, I'm missing that. I'm well, really... you, you want that, you want it all to go away or you want someone to say you, you've done the right thing all along, Harry. You've got it. You'll be okay. Nibbana will touch your body. I can see it as a wish, a, 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 an insane wish, but a wish. But I don't. How is it fulfillment? I, that that part of the word. That part of the. We I, want to be fulfilled. Oh, okay. We want. Yes. We want that. We to want be to be fulfilled. Fulfilled. Yeah. yeah. And we want you know and the you know, the Lokadama thing, praise and blame, retinue and lack of same. I mean, it's just not. It ain't going to happen to any of us. And, and, uh, and even if it did, <laughs> at this point, I would probably distrust it. You know, I mean, if, if the whole world said, Harry, you're right, I basically come back to my own experience on and off the cushion with the practice. And that is enough. Um, that's all the truth I need. That's all the truth I really need. That's why we're doing it. Yeah. I had, I had, I, t I got the second booster this week on Monday and I, I, all the others, the, the other three, no problem on this one. It knocked me out. I was fever. I, and, and, you know, I, and when I had COVID for that matter, I was in the hospital for three weeks. I, I had, a really hard time even remembering to be mindful, you know, because I'm so focused on on the physical discomfort. I mean, that's, I suppose if I was more advanced or whatever, I'd be able to tap into that, you know, but you're talking about the molasses and everything. Um, it's usually when I'm coming out of some sort of physical illness, and I've been fortunate to have very few of them, that's when I remember, oh yeah, meditation or, or mindfulness. I, you know, I, when I'm in the depths of it, I, I, I once heard that Cardinal Bernardin said that you should develop your meditation practice. And he was thinking in terms of Christian, but it doesn't, um, while you well, because when you're sick, you need the momentum to carry you through those periods. And I don't know if you have any, Do you have any hints, like when you're in the depths of that jet lag or on the depths of this COVID two-day reaction thing? Um, I, guess the, I guess the answer is to practice more before and then hopefully the momentum will carry you. Does that mean anything? Am I saying anything? Uh, you're reminding me of, of times at the Mahasi Center in Rangoon back in the early 80s when I or others would get sick. I remember Upandita coming to look after me, make sure I had medicines and telling me to take rest and not to struggle, but to use my energy in the, in the intense way I did when I was well and I was practicing a lot. Rather just go through the illness, 
Let it take its course, kind of surrender to the elements, fire, water, earth, and air. Let them do their dance and just, you know, comfort your body as best you can. Take nourishment when you can. Take medicine. And he would just explain it like a parent. Parent is right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's wise. I think that's, you know, what we do. That's, we just had a two-year illness, all of us, in some way or another with the pandemic, the pandemic fog. In one way or another, we, we all had it and are still kind of dealing with it. Time. Yeah. So yeah, when we're well, we practice. Sayada and Carl Jung said similar things that if we can practice well between the ages of 35 and, and he used to say 55, but now I would say 65 or 75. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we have our faculties and we have the energy, we have the health and the strength, that, that's a good time to be consistent in our practice those years. That's, a, that's the same thing. It's another, another way of saying what you just are saying. Practice as best we can when we're well. You know, realize the preciousness of life. That's the meaning of that term, samvega, usually translated as um, the preciousness of awareness of preciousness of life or the urgency. Not urgency in an agitated, negative, aversive way, but we don't know when we have our last breath. So urgency with this breath, urgency to be with this breath now, this moment now. That's what some vega is, the preciousness of life, the ephemeralness of life, our last breath at any moment, awareness. Some vega, some vega. That, that really, that, that rings a, a good bell because one of the things I could do when I was in the hospital that I, I couldn't muster up was, was the awareness of the preciousness and the tenuousness of it all was, was that, that I could access. That I, I remember could, you saying that. Yeah. 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 Anyway, that's enough time for me. But anyway, thank you. Thanks, Harry. That was useful to all of us. I got to unmute. Where's the voice? Whose voice? I heard a voice. It was but just Harry. No, it okay. was Harry saying okay. he needed to mute, mute himself. Okay. Anything to add from the Pali about Samwega, Jake? Not so much from the Pali, but tying together the last point about Samwega with Harry's opening question about uh, voices of doubt. <laughs> the thing I keep coming back to from an urgency perspective is just this truth that we're always cultivating something. Mm. And the question is, are we cultivating what we want to be cultivating? <laughs> That's the urgency. Like, Right now, what am I cultivating? Like right now, um, that's the urgency. Hmm. But also for me, it kind of cuts through some of the story about, oh, I'm meditating now, I'm not meditating now, I'm in life now, I'm not in life now. Like you're always cultivating, I'm always cultivating something, what am I cultivating right now? So that's wisdom to me. That's discernment. Are we cultivating greed, hatred, delusion to, to simplify it? Or generosity, kindness, and liberation? That discerning awareness, okay, what's happening right now, like you're saying, because we're always cultivating something. Whatever we're doing, that's the practice. So if behind that, that intention, there's desire for this or that, or aversion from that or this, or confusion, then that's what we're cultivating. So that's a helpful discernment. And then we can switch. Well, I actually want to be cultivating 
uh, I, I like the negative use, the Indian negative use. I want to be cultivating non-greed, because that means everything that isn't greed. I want to be cultivating non-hatred. That means all the Brahma Viharas and all the joy and gladness and reverence and awe, all those positive, healthy mental states and healthy desires. And I want to be practicing non-delusion. So I'm not confused, I'm not bewildered. So I see as it is, not as it's said or described or as I want it or someone else says it is, not a belief system. I want to see as it is. So then it becomes a poignant practice. Like, yeah, I am cultivating a little bit of this greed and what is it like to determine or intend to cultivate non-greed, non-attachment. What does that feel like when we say that? So it's just, again, upaya, skillful means, and we can maybe shift the energy back to the practice of non-attachment. That's, that's the middle way, that's the Buddha's path. That's what we're doing. Anyone else have an offering or experience, question? It's a good, it's a good session we're having. It feels in there. You're pulling me out of the sloth and torpor <laughs> molasses jar, at least for a moment. <laughs> a bunch of moments. <laughs> yeah, Catherine says molasses is sweet. It is I'm inundated by the sweetness of molasses. <laughs> Any way that we can be of service to you today? Actually, one thing that helped me, Quinn, one of Michelle's whispering texts said that it took you like over two weeks one time when you came back from the Chaswa, the Burma retreat, to recover. It took you longer than it's taking me. Me? No, oh. Quinn. Oh, Quinn. Mich Michelle texted me. You know, trying to help me out by comparing <laughs> with Quinn. Well, you know, Quinn was 10 days before she started to feel like she could, you know, lift an arm. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but it's, it was helpful. <laughs> I remember two years ago after I had uh, extensive liver surgery mm -hmm. and I had excruciating pain mm -hmm. and I couldn't take any pain medication mm -hmm. and I wanted to keep my practice and all I could do was just breathing in, breathing out and unpleasant, unpleasant, unpleasant. That's all mm -hmm. I could do. But it got me through. Brilliant. It reminded me that Another way to work with the hindrances is, is just that second foundation of mindfulness. Pleasant is a pure experience. It's not a reaction. Attachment, craving, wanting it to be different, that's a reaction. Pleasant is just pleasant. Unpleasant is a pure experience of the heart. It's not a reaction. Anger, aversion, ill will, wanting something to go away, that's reaction. Pleasant, unpleasant are just what they are, and neutral are just what they are. And they're a way to, to simplify and cut through all, all of the hindrances. Because they're all mostly unpleasant when we see them clearly. Though sometimes in craving, you know, we, we fill ourselves with that like the sweetness of molasses and it feels good for a moment. <laughs> yeah. 
enjoy the molasses. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's gotten too unpleasant. And remember always, in addition to being heart qualities of the shine of being awake, or the qualities of a liberated being, the Brahma Viharas are also a very apt and effective remedies for all the hindrances you know, applying loving kindness to any kind of aversion, or even applying loving kindness to strong attachment, um, because it's a healthy desire, loving kindness. And, and whereas attachment is usually born of identification and ignorance. So likewise, you can take all the Brahma Viharas through all five of the hindrances, and that itself is a practice. So you, if you have an inkling to lean toward kindness and caring and, uh, and delight of the mind, joy and balance, evenness, use them freely. Use them freely and, and liberally with any or all of the hindrances. I'll remember that, Kathy, when I'm doing Tai Chi a little later today. <laughs> she said, molasses is like Tai Chi. <laughs> <laughs> but Tai Chi is aware. <laughs> the molasses I'm in, not much aware. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed um, this Sunday session today. Next week, we'll, Michelle and Jesse will be back on, I think. And um, I wish you all a really good week, a really good seven days uh, that you take something from your practice today and what you're here, here today and see, just apply it to your formal and informal day-to-day um, -day life. See what works for you. Metta blessings care for all of you. Thank you so much.